Yeah, so uh, whenever uh, Unreal launches, uh, we'll get into that. But uh, I did want to say that the um, originally when Epic Game Store came out, I was kind of offended by the fra fragmenting of the community. Uh, Steam seemed to work pretty well for me, and um, I didn't like the notion of timed exclusives and things like that on other platforms. But they purchased goodwill with all their free games, like, you know, they gave me Abzu, so that makes me kind of happy towards them. But the real thing is that I like about Epic is their their percentage is actually reasonable. Um, Steam was developed in a world where people were still printing out CD-ROMs and DVDs and packaging them and things like that, and so distribution was worth uh, you know a third of the um, the take, you know, because it was actually a lot of work. You know, Steam nowadays is just bandwidth, right? Like, you know, there, there's obviously some work they have to do. You know, but not a lot, and most of it is just managed by the the developers, right? And so Steam is mostly just a file service, and they're taking a thirty year game for like hosting your your FTP site. That's how we would have done it back in the day. You put up an FTP site, and people download your game from it. And so they're doing that for you, and they take a thirty year money just for hosting a a download. You know, come on, you know. And, uh, and Epic, you know, takes a much more reasonable cut and their, their engine is free until you make a certain amount of money and then they take a very reasonable cut. Like it just, overall the company, uh, despite, you know, my opinion on like Fortnite and things like that, it's, it's actually reasonable and I actually think they're actually, uh, good for developers, you know, outside, you know, these ongoing concerns about fragmentation and exclusives and things like that. I actually do think that their lawsuit against Apple, which uh, I don't know if you guys followed that, it was really interesting to follow. Um, trying to pressure Apple to reduce the cut they take from uh, the Apple Game Store and had Apple ask some hard questions by federal judges and things like that. Um, I think overall it's actually probably going to be pretty healthy for the industry because Apple and Steam do take too much money, in my opinion, but none of them compare with Roblox, which is uh, in, in, an incredible percentage they take from kids, you know, because it's all, they have a lot of kid developers on Roblox, and unless you make a certain threshold of money, which is like a thousand or ten thousand dollars, they take they take a hundred percent of your money, uh, assuming you want cash in your hand. They will take a hundred percent of your money until you exceed a threshold. Whereas with Unreal Engine, it's the other way around. They take none of your money until your game is moderately successful. Uh, Roblox takes all of your money until you're highly successful in, in Roblox terms. And even then, even after you're the most successful developer, they take something like 70 to 90% of all the cash spent on your game, which is just utterly unconscionable, unethical, horrible, and evil. And uh, uh, the, the fact that Roblox is a thing and has so much goodwill just bothers me based on how exploitative they are in terms of like the percentage taken from you know, kids, right? So, uh, what's going on, Mui? So the, uh, um, I don't play Destiny. I played, I played the free version of Destiny 2 and got up to whatever the level cap was, like 3 or whatever it was, and kind of went, eh. Looter shooters are not my uh, jam. I, I do enjoy... Uh, Borderlands, I guess, and and that's mostly just because it's got some just absolutely ridiculous stuff in it, and and that amuses me. Borderlands is an amusing game uh, to me, and I, and I play with my friend in in Tokyo. Um, that's that's fun too. Um, Destiny Two isn't fun. I didn't I didn't I didn't find I didn't find it particularly compelling. Um, like I said, the mechanics of, of looter shooters just set my teeth on edge. Um, it doesn't make sense from a realism perspective why, you know, every time you find a gun, it's got a light level and, I, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not going to talk too much smack about Destiny 2 because I, I want to, I want Alex to stay in the class and not, not drop, you know, we're, we got five people, every, every life matters. Well, <laughs> Destiny 2 is a great game and... <laughs> Uh, and the, the graphics are good, I guess. I guess the graphics are good. Um, okay. So, uh, a, the pr 
project's finally loaded. So uh, Moya is here. Moya is a graduate of our IS program in game development and in computer science. Um, he just had an interview yesterday with Microsoft. Did they ask you to reverse a, uh, a binary search tree? <laughs> Which is an utterly preposterous concept, because, like, why would you? You know, there's no... There's no, absolutely no reason to invert a binary search tree, you know. Rebalancing a binary search tree, maybe, but like inverting it, it's like, no, that goes against everything a binary search tree stands for. It's so easy. It asks you to count all the nodes that have values within a given range. Yeah, that, yeah, that is easy. Okay. Yeah, cool. Um, good. The, the interviews go well with, uh, with Microsoft. You did it with recursion, yeah, it's really good. Yeah, recursion is yeah, usually uh, the way to go with uh, binary search trees. All right, let's do this. So this is Unreal Engine five. Um, with ray tracing on, so a little bit of motion blur it looks like there, or it might just be the ray tracing shadowing not being particularly good. Uh, oh, the, shadow, the shaders are still compiling? Cool. All right, so let let me show you um, content. Uh, this should work basically the same if you have ray tracing on. Let's put on some steel over here. And whenever the shaders compile, which will be uh, forever, um, yeah, there we go, uh, you'll actually get uh, reflections, like actually decent reflections off the wall or not it's just it's not up oh, there we go it's not reflecting the mannequin <laughs> very well but shaders are still going so who knows all right so uh what it, what we talked about last time was putting objects into the world we talked about setting the materials on an object and building a little house dragging things out using move translate rotate scale these are the three uh, big things, right? You know, translation means moving things around. You click on an object, you drag the, you drag the arrow, and it translates around. Rotation spins things. Scaling makes them bigger and smaller. And we use W, E, and R to switch between those three tools. Uh, delete you. You're kind of annoying me, and you are annoying me as well. So um, we talked about lights. Um, the uh, window, do, 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 do. content browser details, where are you? Where is UE4 classic layout? Okay, there we go. So we'll look more similar to what we've been doing in UE4. Um, so over here we got our palette of stuff. You can drag out basic objects and things like that. Last time we talked about point lights, which uh, basically work like light bulbs. There is some cool stuff you can do with them. So you can change the brightness. And and uh, this is something we haven't talked about, I guess, yet in this class, which is that you can uh, sort of, um, you know, the light selected or whatever, you can um, kind of drag it up and drag it down. And it'll sort of in real time show you what it'll look like with the different values. So you're like, I want, I want that one. I want 123 candles. Now, if you want something bigger than the max, like if you want 1,000, you can just punch it in. You know, or whatever. But uh, if you just click and drag on these things, it kind of goes between two reasonable values for light. If you click on the light here, or you uh, you can enter the light colors directly, it'll give you a color picker, and you can have different colored light. So we can have um, like a reddish purple light here. Um, the attenuation radius is how far out the light uh, shines before it drops off, before it like gets clipped so if you set it to like 10 <laughs> you can see uh, 50 60 100 right so you can you can basically say the light does not go beyond um this this spot here uh source radius 100 
you can use a temperature for the light. Um, and that makes, uh, if you've ever used like soft white light bulbs or things like that, one of the interesting things about light is that it's got a, a temperature. All right, so if you ever look at soft white light bulbs, I knew way before this class I met him on Destiny, that's hilarious. Um, so there you go. So there's different, this is Kelvin's by the way, there's different temperatures of light. And uh, you can oftentimes set these on your monitor. You can have an oranger monitor or a bluer monitor. Um, oftentimes inside of our house we use soft white. In fact, if you look behind me, the lights are kind of yellowish, right? And that's because I have soft white light bulbs in my ceiling fan here. And then back here, though, it's kind of blue, and that's because that's daylight coming in. There's a window over there, and, and there's light pouring in through it. And so that is more of, uh, of a bluer light. And so you can see the difference between the yellow light and the blue light here. And it kind of irks me in, in offices when they sort of intermix uh, warmer and cooler lights, um, like in the uh, fluorescence and things like that, like the... It's warm, 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 blue, warm, because somebody just like screwed in a, a cool, a cool light uh, to replace a burnt out warm light. Uh, that's the kind of thing that I'm like, ah, you know. <laughs> so you can set those uh, color temperatures on the uh, light bulbs. Uh, does it affect the world? Nope. Okay. Well, that's pointless. Uh, does it cast shadows? Uh, yes or no. Um, uh, visible, well, turn it off, hides it basically. Actor hidden in the editor, if you, uh, um, yeah, that doesn't really matter, apparently. Um, and then there are these things called light functions. You can actually download um, the technical specifications for actual real life light bulbs in real life from the international CIA, CIE, I think it's called, um, the International Light Association. And um, no, this is the material, sorry. Uh, I, I, yes, yeah. So you can actually download actual physical profiles for light bulbs because like they don't shine evenly out in different directions, right? So if you want to have a realistic light bulb, you can actually go to the International Electrical Society or whatever it's called and download the profiles for different light bulbs and actually use them and then the light will come out brighter in some areas and dimmer. In some areas you actually get very realistic lighting just for free, you just download it and then you just um, select it in here. Um, yeah, so that's good for now. So actually that'd be a good time to mention how to import things into, into a world. So all of this stuff in your um, content browser here is actually just a directory on your hard drive. If you right click on a folder and go to uh, show an explorer, it'll actually take you to the place on your hard drive where all this stuff is. And so um, if you import from the marketplace and download into a project, uh, it'll just put it in here automatically for you. If you don't, uh, if you import directly, you just can drag things in. Like, um, let's say we wanna import a sound or something. Um, there are websites that have free sounds, and so you just search for free sounds, copyright free sounds, we don't want to get sued by anybody for using their copyrighted assets without permission. And, uh, I don't know, what kind of sound do you guys think I should, I should search for? Are you guys here? You guys hear me? Great taste over. What kind of what kind of sound should I search for? Give me some ideas. Nature sounds. Well, that's a nature sound. Twilight, like the vampires. Vampire sucking blood, or something. Wilhelm scream. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. Okay. You can see I've searched for it before here. 
All right. So this is this is the most famous scream in Hollywood cinema. If you're, if you're not familiar with the uh, Wilhelm scream, it is used all over the place. Somebody falls off a balcony. Ah! Um, is that coming through on uh, on Discord for you guys? Can you hear that? If not, I'll I'll just post I'll post the link for you and you can you can play it for yourself. So I'm going to download it and save it and save it to the desktop. Why not? Okay. So I'm just I'm just showing you how to import. We're not. Eh, I guess we can do a little bit of sounds right now. So. I go up to the desktop and there is the Wilhelm scream. It's in wave format, which it needs to be for Unreal Engine. And I'm going to just drop it in. Eh. You know what, I'm actually gonna make a folder here called Bill. I usually do this just for um, anything I bring in, just so that it's all in one place. And uh, maybe I'll rename this. It's not quite so long. Wilhelm scream wave, and there we go. So you notice I created a folder and I put a thing in there and then down here, look, there's now Bill. Double click on that. Drop files here. Ooh, uh, would you like to import it? Yes, import. Thank you. And processing source functions. Okay, cool. And here is, is this problems? All right. Uh, so there is the Wilhelm scream. It's been imported. And file media source. Why is that not imported as an audio file? That's odd. Huh. Weird. Um, let's not do it that way. There's a more proper way of doing it. So I'll put it back on the desktop where it was before. And I'm going to click on the import button here from inside of the build directory. And I'm going to go up to the desktop and select Wilhelm Scream. Do you want to replace the existing asset? Yes, I do. Fail to create asset. Okay, well, probably because I deleted it and it doesn't like that. Uh, butchered it. <laughs> just create a new wave file then it won't know it won't know that it's <laughs> the same one all right import wilhelm.wave fail to import create fail to create asset let's get the apple file for details the apple file. unsupported oh it's an unsupported that's why it didn't work interesting How did that work in the... Hmm. Okay. Huh. That's interesting. I wonder, if, I wonder if that's a change between UE4 and UE5. All right. So we will do Twilight for you, Meredith. Uh... See if this one will work. All right, so save it. Again, we're gonna drop it on the desktop. This is the process. I'm not gonna close out of free sounds now because I need to see if UE5 is weird about this now. So I'm gonna import the owl. There it is, and it plays. Okay, so there's just something weird about the file format of that other one. There we go. So that's how you import things into Unreal Engine uh, manually. I usually just download them to a folder and then use the import button and pull them in that way. Or you can drag things in, and it, if you if you drag things in uh, on uh, your internet or your file explorer, then a window will pop up saying like, "Hey, we noticed you put something in the directory. Would you like to import it?" And you say yes, and then it does it for you. So 
Um, there's other ways of doing it as well. Uh, right click import works as well. Okay, so that's how you that's how you bring things into the game. Um, also, the uh, the marketplace is of course a good a good place as well. All right, so details panel uh, lights uh, allow you to change all this stuff the the angle of the spotlight the intensity of the spotlight um, inner cone outer cone and so you can play with these things just forever to get just exactly the right um, exactly the right look that you're looking for yeah this is UE5 um, yeah it looks a little nicer I guess um, Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? We are going to talk about fog. We'll do fog real fast. So uh, if you drag out an exponential height fog into your map, then it will add fog to your level. And so that is, again, going to be on the uh, palette on the left-hand side here. And uh, you can just search for fog if you want. Um, there's a couple different kinds of fog. We want to use an exponential height fog and uh, just drag it out. And the location of it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you put uh, this fog. It's sort of just there in the world. And uh, then play with the different settings. And as you play with the different settings, you can see that the level becomes foggier. You can add um, altitude to it. You can give it a color. So the fog can change colors. Looks like a disco now. Just cancel that. The default color is fine. Uh, fog's max opacity. Zero turns it off, right? So you can you can cap how how thick it is. Starting distance of zero. Fog cutoff distance of fifty. Um, now, a cool thing to do is to do volumetric fog. So volumetric fog, so uh, a, a, an exponential height fog by default is just kind of like the further something is away, the more fog there is on it. And so like if you've ever driven in the Central Valley, <laughs> never, uh, you've probably encountered fog at some point. And just kind of the further away things are, the more foggy they are. And if I were to um, have mountains off the distance, they would be covered in fog. Now, volumetric fog is a little bit different. It actually physically simulates fog and light bouncing around inside of fog. It's really cool. So if I turn that on and play with this a little bit until it looks interesting. Um, and hit play. You'll see that you see how this fog actually has like a physical presence in the world now. It's no longer just like the further something is away, the more foggy it is. You can actually see that the fog is actually interacting with the lights, which is really cool. It's a neat effect. Volumetric fog is super cool, and you can see here there is there is a performance penalty on it, but you can see here that there's like this warm ball of kind of foggy light from that pink light there. And then we've got this white spotlight here that, you know, looks kind of weird and out of place because there's no lamp, you know, hanging, hanging there. But you can see that it's just kind of in the world. And fog and light are, you know, and color are like your, your tools for creating emotion in a video game. So it's, um, it's always really important to think about what kind of emotions you want to create in your players because emotion is what connects a player to a game right like most of our our favorite games have some sort of like emotional connection maybe not all of them like there's no emotional connection from chess you know maybe from playing chess at, in Budapest or something but like the game itself doesn't have really much of an emotional connection but if you think back on like you know your favorite games over time there's there's usually some 
storyline or, or something that kind of touches you, you know, emotionally, and that's that's what makes for, for really top-notch video games. Uh, Ghost of Tsushima, which came out a couple years ago, um, has, just through visual storytelling, has this amazing ability to set mood and ambiance and emotion and things like that. It's really, really a masterpiece of the video game. And uh, so, yeah, lighting, fog, the choice of colors you, you, you use um, tells people about, about the game. Like, Cyberpunk has very garish colors, you know, and, and quite deliberately so. It's not accidental that they have lighting like this, you know. Um, whereas a game set out in, you know, nature might have mist and fog and waterfalls and things like that and create a sense of serenity and beauty using lighting and fogging like that. Okay. So, um, so what else? Okay. Uh, any questions, first of all? Uh, Meredith, Alex, and uh, um, Pata? About fog and stuff like that? Lighting, fog, mood, emotion. You don't have anything to add. It's pretty straightforward. Okay. All right. Um, so if you click on the sky, you can set uh, the, the sky settings. Um, let's see. Override settings. Here we go. Clouds determine. The colors change based on the sun's position. Uh, yeah, you can pick which where the sun is, the sun's brightness. Um, you make the clouds move quicker so they're blowing overhead quickly how th thick the clouds are um, a lot of things you can, you can play with that there's also atmospheric fog which is how the light scatters in the upper atmosphere as well but let's um, let's get to the basics of making um, something interactive in Unreal Engine. So let's talk about trigger volume here. Hmm. What happened? Is it there? Where do you go? Oh, weird. What the hell happened? Okay, so um, this is sometimes called a box trigger, and there's also a uh, um, sphere trigger. Let's see if if I search recently placed all classes trigger. Okay, there we go. Box trigger. Okay, so I'm gonna drag out a box trigger, and I'm gonna just make it uh, cover the stairs. And so if you've ever played a video game where like when you walk into a room like a cutscene triggers or um, you walk up to a door and the door opens in front of you or you jump into water and something happens, a lot of times what's happening is that there is a invisible trigger zone that if you touch it, it triggers the cutscene or whatever. And sometimes speedrunners will exploit this because sometimes they'll figure out you know, like ways of like getting around the uh, trigger and, and avoiding the cutscene and things like that. Um, and so by default, you can see it's invisible. It doesn't show up when the game runs. Uh, nothing happens when you touch it. So that's by default, it does nothing. Okay. And uh, it's got an icon here so you can kind of select it kind of like with the, the light and the fog. There's an icon so you can click on it and select it, but it's not... It, the icon is not drawn in the game world. And so uh, what we're going to do is uh, for this. Okay, 
So in Unreal Engine 4, there's a button, a blue button that says uh, add blueprint. Do you guys see that? The blue button? Or is it green? It's called blueprint. It's like when you have the when you have the, the box trigger selected, it there should be a button that says blueprint kind of over on the details panel on the right hand side here. What color is it? Blue or green? My hotspot keeps overheating and kicking me off the internet. It's alright, you can watch you can watch the uh, the recording later. We're just gonna do the world's simplest um, the world's simplest trigger right now. So Alex, Pata, what color what color is the button? We're gonna find out if you guys actually have Unreal Engine open or not. Or if you're just like watching. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll stop torturing you. So I'm going to add a blueprint to this. And uh, I'm going to call this uh, um, sound trigger or something like that. And we're going to get our first um, view of how programming works in, in, uh, in Unreal Engine. So uh, I turn it into a blueprint. And then I click on event graph. And so these are events that can happen. So what we're looking at here is when something happens, do something. And currently everything's grayed out, they're all disabled. So by default, it does absolutely nothing. So if we wanted to do something, you have to drag out from this white pin here. You click and drag. And then whatever this thing attaches to is gonna happen whenever something overlaps the box. In other words, if somebody walks inside of the box, Whatever I attach here, where my mouse is, is going to happen. Okay, And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say play sound. I'm going to play a 2D sound, which means there's no position. It just appears in your speakers. And I'm going to play the owl sound, just like that. And as simple as that, I hit compile. I hit save. Every time you make a change, you're going to compile and save, compile and save, compile and save over and over again. And, uh, and save all. There we go. And then when I run the game, the owl plays a sound. Okay. Simple as that. That's, you know, last 10 minutes of class and you just learned how to make a game interactive. Okay. So simple as that. You, you uh, make a trigger. And then you click on the trigger uh, the first time after, you, after you've done it, you can just double click on it um, and pull it up again. Uh, but the first time, the very first time, you turn the trigger into a blueprint by, there's gonna be a button, either green or blue, I don't remember off the top of my head now. In Unreal Engine 5, it's this little thing here. You turn it into a blueprint, hit okay, and then go over to what's called the event graph here. And you can drag out from these, these things. And so the other options you have is begin play. So begin play is like when the level loads, you can have it do something. Um, I don't know what we would have it do. Maybe just print something to the screen and uh, have it say, Kearney is awesome. Like that. And if we do that and play the game, you can see that when the game, when the level loads right there, Kearney is awesome. It appears for a couple seconds and it vanishes. And if I walk over that, woo -hoo, woo -hoo, okay. it plays, it plays the sound. If I walk over it again, it'll trigger again. If I walk over it again, it'll trigger again. And you can see I'm now getting like some techno beatbox owl. <laughs> it's going nuts. All right. So, and then the other thing we can do by default is event tick. So this means every frame, every, uh, every second, if you're getting 60 frames a second, event tick will run 60 times a second. So this code, every time the computer draws the screen, it's gonna call uh, this thing. And so I could have it, uh, for example, every tick, I could have it, um, I could have it, um, Spawn an emitter. <laughs> uh, let's see if I can do it this way. Yeah, 
and we'll do an explosion. Let's just see how this works. Compile, save, play. Let's see if that works now. Right. So we'll, we'll do it the better way. So spawn emitter allocation. Don't worry about what I'm doing here. I'm just going to see if this works. Collision component, center, spike, sprite component, collision component here. And I'm going to get the location here and drag that in here. And let's just see if this works in UV5. Huh, it's not playing it. because I need to choose a asset. Let's just see if this works before I talk about it. There we go. So every frame, it's playing an explosion at its location, which is kind of wild. And um, I, I know I didn't show you exactly what I did, but I think you saw how little effort that was. And now I've got something that every, literally every frame, 60 times a second, 100 times a second, it is drawing an explosion at its location. Okay, so let me put this back up on the screen here. And uh, these are kind of the three, uh, at least starting points of making a, a video game interactive, right? Uh, there's, there's other things as well, like if something runs into you, um, that's a little bit different from, from this one where you walk inside of it. A box trigger you walk inside of, a rock you hit. Those are two different things. And so uh, this is, and the level loads do something. So that's that's what event begin play means. When the level loads, lo do some code. Uh, this is when someone enters my zone, do something. And so when we walk inside of that zone trigger, it plays the owl sound. And then this one is every frame. Are you guys familiar with the concept of a frame? Do I need to explain that? Like what a frame is in video games? All right, see you, Quentin. Um, Meredith, do you know what a frame is in a video game? 30 frames a second, 60 frames a second. How often? How often the screen updates, how often it refreshes. Alex, you know what it is, right? Your FPS. What kind of what kind of FPS, what kind of frames per second do you get in Destiny 2? So with this code, every frame it is running code, and the code is to produce an explosion. And you need to give it a location. This is spawn emitter at location. We did CSS animation with frames. Okay, cool. Yeah, so it needs a location to put the explosion. So what I did was I dragged in the collision component. And then I dragged out from that and said, get, get the location of it. And so I am getting the location of the box trigger and spawning an explosion at it every frame. So if I'm getting 150 frames a second, it will spawn 150 explosions at the same location every time. Uh, which um, it's going to be a bit wild, right? So uh, I'm on all low settings like a real gamer. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're we're basically out of time. But your homework assignment is going to be to do uh, to do what we just did here. So uh, add a add fog, add some volumetric fog to your cabin in the woods, and then make a. Uh, Make it so that when you walk in the door, it plays a sound. Okay. Honey, I'm home. An owl hooting. Um, vampire blood sucking sounds if you like Twilight. You know, whatever. It's all it's all good. So, uh, to do the fog, you're going to drag out an exponential height fog and make sure you check the volumetric fog tick box and play around with the settings to get it nice and kind of hazy. Add fog, then you're going to add a, a trigger, box collision, 
and then you're going to convert the box collision into a blueprint and then you're going to drag out from begin overlap and have it play a sound and the sound is going to need to be imported from some website and then you're, you're done yep <laughs> okay um and so just because we got a well i don't know if we have any time left but I got four minutes before office hours, so I'm just going to make this look a little bit more interesting. Uh, so I'm going to actually add a little bit of randomness to this. So I'm going to add, I'm going to add to this a little bit of randomness. I'm going to create like a cluster bomb effect. It should look kind of cool. And if you want to cut a wire, hold down Control and click on it. That'll clip the wire. Or Alt click uh, will do it as well. Um, and then I'm going to do a random, um, <laughs> do this. So I'm going to add a random point in a bounding box and I'm going to do negative 100, negative 100, nope, negative 100. Negative 100, 100, 100, 100. Oh, that's the origin. Uh, yeah, either way. Should work. Compile, save, play. And now I got cluster bombs going off. Hey, that's kind of cool, right? What do you think, Alex? Is that destiny worthy? If you had a grenade that exploded like that, you'd be impressed, right? <laughs> it's a cool effect right so just every frame it's spawning an explosion and I'm just adding a little bit of randomness to the location so yeah. do you get loot from it yes it's light level will be one higher than your current light level <laughs> scatter grenade yeah seriously you send it and that's that's literally how easy it is to make um, uh, to make stuff in Unreal Engine and, and don't worry if you didn't follow that. Um, we're we're gonna trust me. We're, we have all semester to to learn this kind of stuff. I'm just kind of giving you a a brief kind of preview of um, how this kind of how this kind of stuff works. And just you, if you see how it's laid out, you know, you just kind of drag things from one pin to another. And so I'm getting the location, and then I'm going to add to the location a random point. And so I just drag from that into that, and the results of this addition gets dragged into the location. And so that's the location that the explosion will start at. And so you kind of read it from left to right. And white is the flow of control. So um, it for when you begin overlapping, it'll play a sound. And then if I want to do something else, I would drag out from there. And it would do that next, and so on and so forth. So you, you don't need to you don't need to do uh, you don't worry about this kind of stuff, Meredith. Um, just when when somebody overlaps the trigger, play a sound. So, uh, from scratch, uh, after you've made the blueprint, you're going to drag out from the white pin here, type in play sound 2D, and uh, you see, so what this means is when somebody walks into the doorway, because that's where I have the, the box trigger set up, or the stairway, then it runs this, and what it's going to do, it's going to play a sound, and it's 2D, it's, uh, it just plays in your speakers. There's no, it's not in the world. It's not like if you turn your head in the world, it'll be louder one way or the other. It just plays in your speakers flat, no attenuation or anything. And you can just choose a, you can just choose a sound to play. Compile and save. Don't forget that. And then when you play it, it plays the explosion sound. That's it. That's you got till Tuesday to do that. Okay. So that is uh, that is today. So we went over some more of the basics of Unreal Engine. Uh, I'm gonna have to stop saying UE4 out of habit because um, I did UE5 today, which looks a little bit different, but the, it's it's really basically the same in both of them. Can you have a display JPEG image? Yeah, you can. Uh, but um, that's a lecture. How to do that? Um, we're gonna have a lecture on HUDs at some point, but um, yeah, uh, just for now, just add some fog to your cabin in the woods and.
have it play a sound when you walk in the front door. Honey, I'm home, or whatever. You know, it's all good. Remember to save all constantly, and uh, just have fun with it. Like, this class is, is a fun class. You get to make video games. And so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach you each of the different basic skills you need for making a video game. How do I play a sound? How do I get a mouse click? How do I... Uh, how do I draw a line through the world and hit something? How do I, how do I, how do I? All the basic skills you're going to learn over the next nine or ten weeks, and then by the end of the semester, you'll put them all together to make a project. Okay. All right, so that's it for today. Thanks for coming out, everyone. I will upload this video so you can re-watch it and peruse it at your leisure. And uh, just post, uh, again, just post the screenshots on Discord after you get it done. Um, and, uh, yeah, just remember to have fun. Okay, see you guys.